Hello, everybody who are watching the recording and in our Zoom workshop today. I'm going to talk a little bit, as I mentioned on Sunday, about tax efficient charitable giving. And I think this is uh, a good topic for our folks at CPC because I know folks here are very, very enthusiastic givers of both time and money. And I'm happy to share with you some strategies and techniques that I work with uh, with a lot of my, my clients and show you how it can, it can be beneficial both for CPC as well as for your tax bill come April 15th. So we'll go ahead and get started. So this is the agenda. I hope to cover these various topics, talking about IRAs, individual retirement accounts and qualified charitable distributions, which is a specific type of distribution from an IRA. We'll talk a little bit about donating appreciated securities. We'll look at another benefit from donating those securities that we didn't talk about on the previous slide. We'll talk about potentially uh, bunching your gifts. So paying 2022 pledges in 2021. And then lastly, some what may be limited time only tax benefits. And so we'll go through each of these in turn. And then at the end, we'll make ample time for, for questions if you have any about any of the material. All right, so everyone know what IRAs are, right? So you save diligently over your career. And at some point you shift from sort of an accumulation mindset to more of a depletion mindset of your savings. And I've actually found that this is actually quite difficult for a lot of my clients, especially the more diligent savers, right? That makes sense. You've done such a good job of following all the financial advice. And then you get to the day where you're actually now you know, enjoying the fruits of those labors. And a lot of people find it actually a little bit challenging to do so. So some of the rules around withdrawals from IRAs, the earliest you can do it without penalty, generally, there are exceptions, but generally is age 59 and a half. And then once you turn now 72, age 72, you're actually required to start drawing down from your IRA. And those are called required minimum distributions. That's what the R, the M, and the D stand for. And not only are you required to draw down from your IRA, but the government will tell you what that minimum amount is. And at age 72, it's about 3.7%, almost 4% of your total balance. So if you have a healthy sized IRA, you could be drawing down quite a bit. And it may in a lot of cases be more than you need from a living expense standpoint, if you have other sources of retirement income. So for a lot of retirees, this actually comes as quite a surprise that they're essentially forced to draw down on that balance at that, at that date. So how is that money taxed? Whether you draw it out at 59 and a half or at 72 or at some point in between? Well, it's, it's essentially taxed as income. 100% of the amount of the withdrawal is taxed at whatever your income rate is, your marginal tax rate for income. So just to give you an example, if your RMD is $10,000, so you're 72 or above, you're required to draw down a set amount, let's say that amount is $10,000. Even if you don't need it, you have to draw it down. If you're in the 22% federal tax rate, it's $2,200 of tax on the full amount of that withdrawal, all the money you put in, all of the growth of that money, and then you are left with, after tax, $7,800, okay? So that's essentially how IRA distributions work. Now, what you can do though, is after age 70 and a half, okay? There's reasons why these ages don't really line up really well, I'm not gonna go into it, but starting at age 70 and a half, okay? You can make what are called qualified charitable distributions from your IRA. Okay, and these, if you distribute them correctly, are not taxed at all for either yourself or the charity. You do have to make the donation from your IRA to a charity, 501c3 organization such as CPC. Those are taxed at zero, both for you and for the charity. They get the full amount. They get the full amount. So same $10,000 distribution now as a QCD versus an RMD, what happens? No federal tax, okay? And in, in most cases, no state tax, though some states will tax it differently, okay? But for, we're just gonna talk about the federal tax, uh, tax code, no federal taxes. 
you, as the giver, you fulfill your R&D for the year. This counts. This counts as that required distribution. Okay. Um, and really, there is, you know, if, if you guys have been following closely, there is that year and a half where you don't really have an RMD, but you can do a QCD. Okay. So I'm really talking about after 72, you do fulfill the RMD for the year if the amount, you know, is as high as you need it to be. And the full $10,000 goes to charity. So in some ways, if you know this, right, it may allow you to give more to the, to the organization. And also, you know, remove it from your taxable income for the year, which is great, you know, because there are things like your Medicare contribution that are actually income driven. So it'd be great if you could remove this amount that you're essentially required to take out of your IRA, right? You can remove it from your taxable income and that may, you know, lower other expense elements, you know, in your, in your, um, you know, day to day, day to day living. Any questions? on QCDs. Marian. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so I have an inherited IRA that I just, uh, when my mom passed away this year. And yeah. I am not 70 and a half, but I have to, um, my understanding is I have to completely um, pay out this inherited IRA, yeah, IRA, when did she IRA pass over away? the next five years. When did she pass away? She passed away in April. Okay. So I think, it I think be 10 years. Oh, okay. Is it 10? Okay. I think so. Um, okay. If you're, if you're not a spouse, I believe it's, you have to do it at, by 10 years from the end okay. of the year. So that, that's year. a question. Is it five or 10? But the yeah. other question is, can I use mm -hmm. this qualified charitable distribution, even though I'm not 70 and a half, um, with that distribution? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I don't think so. I would have to check, but I'm pretty sure it does not work for, it is, does not apply to inherited IRAs. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Good question. Okay. So I said you have to do it a certain way, right? If the funds are distributed directly to you, the IRA owner, and then you turn and give it to charity, that does not qualify to the QCD. It actually has to come from the custodian where your IRA is held. So, you know, what is it today? The eighth? So this is just about the time when I usually direct my clients, like any plan giving of this sort, like should be initiated very soon uh, to, to make sure everything happens by December 31st. Okay, capital gains taxes. So this is, this is uh, not on the agenda, but this is a little background information. So let's say you bought $1,000 of Apple stock. You felt really good. You looked at how many Apple devices you had in your home and you're like, wow, I should really buy some of this Apple stock. And two years later, you sell it for $11,000. So it's really grown a lot in that time. Good on you, all right? So you sell it for a thousand, eleven thousand. So you essentially, you essentially made, quote unquote, made ten thousand, ten thousand dollars. These are called long-term capital gains. So you invested some money in Apple. The value of your investment grew. You sold the Apple stock, and you re, and you realized a gain of ten thousand dollars. And it's considered a long-term gain, as are any gains that of any investments that you hold over a year. So if you held it for two years, it's a long-term gain. Now, long-term capital gains are taxed for most people at most income levels at about 15%, at 15%, okay? So David, do the math. How much is your tax? Oh, you didn't think I was gonna call on anybody, huh? You need to unmute your mic. So $1,500. Yes, very good, right? Your tax is $1,500. And so you can take home after tax $8,500, okay? Which is great, great. I mean, what, what did you do in this time to make that $8,500? Not much, <laughs> not much, right? So that's fantastic. Now, an alternative, okay, with this stock is to donate it. How does that work? Well. It starts the same way. You buy that same $1,000 of Apple stock. It appreciates, and two years later, it's worth $11,000. And this is where it changes in terms of your actions, right? So instead of selling it, 
and realizing those $10,000 of long-term capital gains, you decide to donate the $10,000 of Apple stock to say, fulfill your CPC pledge or to another charitable organization. And this is, this is better because that $10,000 donation of appreciated stock in the form of Apple shares has zero taxation for you and zero taxation for the charity. They receive the full $10,000 amount. At CPC, if they were to receive the stock, they would immediately, I believe we would immediately be required to liquidate it and, mm -hmm. uh, and use the proceeds. So that's great. More for the, for the uh, recipient organization. And, and you, if you itemize your taxes, you actually can take the full pre-tax donation, the 10,000 as a deduction to your income for that year. So not just the, what would have been the after-tax portion, but the full value. Amazing. Okay, so I did mention there was another benefit to appre donating appreciated securities. And actually this is, I think, you know, sometimes Younger folks will be like, well, you know, I'm, I don't want to sell any of my shares, you know, but there is actually another benefit that I think applies to a lot of people, not just those whose, whose assets have had the time to appreciate. Uh, and that is, let's start with the same situation. You buy $1,000 of Apple stock. Uh, let's say this is the entirety of your portfolio. So you're a relatively new investor, relatively early in your in your you know accumulation phase, I guess we call it. And now two years later, it's worth eleven thousand dollars. And 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 maybe maybe you've probably talked to me, and I've been like, wow, that's a lot of your your investment eggs in in this one apple basket. <laughs> maybe you want to diversify your holdings a little bit, uh, or or something like that. I've been known to say things like that. So what you can do is that if you in fact were going to fulfill your pledge, say, to CPC or donate to charity other cash funds, what you can do, if you donate this Apple stock, this $10,000, right, and you don't want to, you don't want to just sell it because you would pay some tax on it, you know, you would pay capital gains tax. What you can do is you can donate the stock, taxation, as we already discussed, is zero for you, zero percent for the charity, right, and take the $10,000 cash that you would have donated right? And buy back that Apple stock. It resets your cost basis. So now the gain, right? The gain that you had, you're not going to pay tax on it because you've given that stock away. You're just buying at a new price. So now you've bought $10,000 of Apple stock. So if you sold it, you wouldn't pay any tax because there's no gain. You've essentially donated the gain to an organization. You can rebuy your Apple stock. Let's say if you didn't listen to me, or you could rebalance, you know, and diversify your holdings. Okay. Any questions? All right. All right. 2022 pledges in 2021. Maybe this might be a good idea for, for some of us. So how so? In a tax year, you do have to usually make the decision whether you're going to take what's called the standard deduction or whether you're going to itemized deductions. So these are reductions of your income that you can take, okay? Now, generally, you want to take the higher of the two, right? So if you itemize, you want to make sure that what you're reducing from your income, that total of that value is higher than what you're allowed to just deduct, anybody to deduct, regardless of what deductions they actually have. So in 2021, let's say, you know, you could have this scenario where you have $10,000 of charitable items that you can deduct from income and you have say 14,000 of other deductions. Say the most common ones are mortgage interest, you can deduct uh, state and local taxes, you can deduct those tend to be the largest, the largest other deductions that people take. So you see here, maybe it adds up to about 24,000 and then you estimate that in 2020, 22, it's gonna likely be about the same. Okay, so what kind of decision are you making at the ends of those tax years in regards to whether you're going to take the standard deduction or the itemized deduction? Probably in both cases, you're going to take the standard deduction because that's higher. If you marry filed jointly, 
the 2021 deduction is 25,100. And in 2022, it went up by $800. Okay, so you would probably take the standard deduction both years. This, because you always, because even if your total deductions were like zero, you could still take the standard deduction. So it's just a, a deduction from your income. Like the first 25.1 or 25.9 of your income is essentially free of tax. Okay, so you're probably gonna take the standard deduction. Okay, total deductions then over the two years, $51,000. Now, if you were to instead say, oh, maybe I'll just pay my 2022 pledge early, say at the end of 2021, then what would it look like? In 2021, you'd have two years of, say, charitable deductions. So your total deductions are 34,000. And then in 2022, right, you've pulled forward your charitable donation into 2021 as a tax year. So you only had 14,000 of deductions you foresee. Well, standard or itemized? What about 2021? Standard deduction? That was 25.1, or are you gonna take the itemized? Take the itemized, because it's a bigger, yeah. bigger number, good, right? Yeah. And then in 2022, again, assuming also again, married family joint, probably gonna take the standard, because it's so much higher than the itemized one, because you pulled forward your charitable deduction from 2022 into 2021. So now what did we do? We've, we've given the same amount of money away, but now our total 2021, 2022 deductions from income is 59,900. So that, that's, a, that's an increase of about $8,900. That will save you about 2,000 in tax if you're in the 22% tax bracket by bunching your charitable donations. Okay, and again, right, if we can reduce our, our income, then that may also, you know, reduce various other expenses, say the, what you pay for Medicare and whether your social security benefit is taxed, right? That, they look at your total income uh, in assessing whether those types of income and expenses, the, the, actual, the actual rate, so all good. Questions? Yeah, David, you want to turn on, um, I think you need to unmute yourself. So one of the things that people can run into is there's also a limit on the amount of deductions, right? Um, yes, we'll talk about that on the next slide. Very okay. good. Okay. Very nice segue. <laughs> Very nice segue. Any other questions on bunching charitable donations in tax years? Yeah, and you know, as I'm still working right now, but I, I think one of the, you know, the, the really the, one of the nice benefits in when you're retired is you have a little more control over your income, you know, and when you have a little bit more control over your income, the cash flow coming in, you have a lot more control over the tax rate of the, the income, you know, because you can choose, you know, what you can choose to, to quote unquote earn, right? I mean, whereas we who are still working, we get a regular paycheck and that's sort of set and we have, we have a little bit less ch uh, choice in that. So I'm trying to get there as fast as I can. And uh, the next stage, okay. All right, so uh, to Dave's question about caps. Yes, there are caps, right? So charitable deductions, that number there, the 20,000 say if you choose to bunch your donations, there is a cap to that what that can be as a percentage of your total income. So you cannot deduct more than 30 and 60% of your adjusted gross income with charitable deductions. 30% if it's non-cash and 60% if it's cash donation. So like if, it, if you're donating say Apple stock, that value because you know, you're not paying the capital gains, that has to be capped at 30%. And cash donations are capped at 60%. So you're absolutely right, David, that there is a cap, an annual cap to what you can donate and deduct. Absolutely. Ah, but in 2021, this is what Marion was ask, asking about at the very top of the workshop was that, you know, you know, is is the um, do I think this is gonna be extended this? increase in the cap, do I think it's going to be extended into 2022? I mean, I, I, I hesitate from, you know, making any projections about tax policy generally, but 
I always think it might not, so don't don't count on things. But the 2021 cap is actually uh, temporarily higher. So cash donations, instead of having a 60% cap, you can actually donate now 100% of your adjusted gross income uh, and deduct that from your income. And anything in excess of 100%, right? You can actually carry forward up to five five tax years. And um, you know, we we have a couple of members of FinCom on this call here, but you know, I've been thinking too that you know we talk about you know, the importance of having that stable, you know, pledge base, you know, for the, for the work and uh, for the work of the church. And, you know, I think back to, to how a lot of companies are run that they do longer term planning, like three year, five year planning, right? So not just focused on like the immediate, what's going to happen next year. And so maybe, sorry to spring this on you, but maybe that's something we think about, you know, as a, as a church about how those pledges are structured time-wise, because, you know, the one year is pretty arbitrary. Right. So, you know, this could be something that would that would help us have uh, have better long term planning for all the various uh, ministries in in the church. OK, so that's the last like sort of financy taxi slide here. Any questions about anything I went over? OK, I just have one more slide. Uh, and that. Is uh, and that has to do actually with uh, a little bit about money and happiness. So I I work in financial coaching and financial education, and so I I find it what I do is essentially make teach like work with people to to make the the way they use their money right the way they use their money actually be a way that they actually enjoy right to get the the most like sort of that kind of happiness value out of it. Cause I think some people aren't really good at how to utilize the resources they have for maximized personal fulfillment, right? So I read a lot about happiness and money research. And one of the things that, you know, so you can imagine some of the, some of the guidelines. So things like uh, uh, buy time versus things or buy experience over things. Uh, buy time, invest in others. Those are some of the common things of how do I spend my money that maximizes happiness. And another one is um, to prepay, <laughs> to prepay, because then like, then like when it actually happens, you don't have like sort of the, 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 the stress of actually, you know, spending and feeling like you're, you're using, it's just like prepay. And so I'm like, I'm a big fan of like that prepaying the, the pledges, you know, so you get to support CPC and then for the rest of the year, you like kick back and enjoy because you've already, you've already, you've already like, you know, paid for your music and the coffee and the fellowship. So you can just kick back and enjoy. So uh, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with that. That's why cruises are so popular apparently is the prepaying factor. And then you just go and you're like, it's like free vacation. Cause you've already, you the, the actual putting down the payment is so far in the, so far in your history. So, all right, that's it. That's that's all I've got here, folks. So if you have any uh, other questions, I'm happy to address them now. I always uh, leave this slide up when I teach to remind me that not everybody is as familiar with these issues. Always a good reminder. Chris, I was so succinct, um, and you and you hit all the questions that I had. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, bye, Mary. I think Mary needs to go. But thank you for joining us, everybody. And please, my my email is there. So if you have any questions about this, like I said, you know, work with your tax advisors. You know, I am not a CPA. Work with your tax advisors to to make sure that this fits with your own. Uh, income and tax filing situation, work with your custodian where your accounts are held, uh, work with, you know, the CPC finance committee or any charitable organization. Most of them of any size have lots of people who are happy to help you, you know, donate to that organization. So I encourage you to, to reach out there if you need assistance, but it's a pretty straightforward process. It does take a little bit of time to do some of these things, but uh, I think right now we've got about three weeks left in the year. So so doable. Thank you, Grace. I'm looking forward to watching the recording of the part I missed. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. It was very good. Thank you. Thank Will you guys you so enjoy? Much. Have a good rest of your week.